Okay, today we're continuing our conversation with Dr. Peter Iltis, who's principal investigator of the MRI horn studies. And our topic we get to now in this part three is range, uh, which is a huge topic for a lot of players. Um, Farkas in the Art of French Horn Playing spends a great deal of time with the muscles of the lips, mm -hmm. but almost nothing on tongue position and vowels. And here's where my own studies helps, uh, because among my teachers was Eli Epstein, who you've worked with, obviously, on this series. And at that point in the time, it was in between my master's and doctorate. His pedagogy at that point was the mid-range was, well, the high range was T, the mid-range was TA, low range was TO. And he's modified that and expanded it, I guess, in his subsequent pedagogy. I think this holds up pretty much with what you've seen in your MRI study. Yeah, sure does. Um, actually, I have to tell you a little background story on that. I, I did not like, <laughs> I hope he doesn't mind me saying this, I never really agreed with the vowels that he used in his book, in his first book. Ho is, is a sound that you make largely by dropping your tongue, but also by shaping your lips. And shaping your lips has nothing to do with tongue position. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, he's, he's modified it now. So it's ha, ha, he, he. Those are the ones that he now puts forth and will be in his third edition. I think there's one that he's left out. I've mentioned it. But I think ha, ha, he, he. He is somewhere between he and he. It's another, just another movement, but again, it's a very small movement. But yeah, uh, these these vowel positions we have verified. Um, they're not, they're not. Per, there's not perfect confluence between saying vowels and playing horn, but it's really close. And oh yeah, yeah it's, it's been really, really an amazing discovery and uh, confirmation. For yeah, you. no, because and it's, it's something important just to publicize a lot because there's there's people I'm sure struggling to try to play high with like they're trying to keep really open yeah. or something artificially, and it's just they're causing themselves problems. Right, it's just not what naturally is gonna gonna work. Yep, or they're pinching hard um, to the embouchure or something. Yeah. Yeah, because it's the traditional teaching is very muscle yep. and air, more air. Yep. You know, more air is the solution to everything. Yep. Um, um, going into the low range, uh, which you, you've also, you just talked about, it. another topic that Farkas actually leaves pretty open mm -hmm. is jaw position right. and breaking the embouchure. Right. Um, what generalities have you seen among, say, the elite, the really good players? Well, I don't think we've been able to look at embouchure break necessarily, John, but we certainly looked at jaw movement, and that was published in our latest paper, um, which is published in uh, Medical Problems of Performing Artists, if you're interested. But there we're looking at uh, ascending and descending harmonic series, and basically it's this. When you're playing harmonics that are in the upper part of the range, there's very little jaw movement. Most of what happens there is accomplished with tongue movements. But when you start to go to the last, let's just say from oh, I don't know, middle C on down, you start to see movements with each, with each harmonic. In fact, even above that. So that there's a progressive and an incremental dropping of the jaw as you go to the lowest partials. Very, very clearly and very consistently in our elite players. Yeah, yeah so I, in relation to that following up, so people, uh, I mean, one thing I do often with people is I have them put their thumb on their jaw just to see what they're doing. Because sure. most people are not actually, do, they think they're dropping their jaw. They honestly believe they yeah, are, yeah. but they're not. Yeah. Um, and then you could drop your jaw in several ways. It seems like it's most people kind of down and out yeah. is, is probably the, the way you need to go. I is that that's what typical. you observe? Yep. yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, so that's like a, a key thing. You bet. Now, um, now, while we're talking about the uh, the oral cavity, mm -hmm. and here's like a question which you may not have also observed. Uh, did you look at lip bends? at all and like what is a lip bend like how, how is what's the mechanism of a lip bend in shaping on a pitch, note? right you mean bending pitch right yeah like say you take a middle c and you go bah, but it's all in the same fingering right. Like, right 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 that's what i thought you meant uh well you don't know we haven't looked at that clearly it's not in the forefront of your mind it would be interesting um I would I would almost bet you that there's tongue movement involved with that. Um, but, again, I haven't looked at it. So maybe that's something we yeah. could add to our protocol. But add it in. I'd be curious yeah. because I think traditionally teachers are thinking it's your lips yeah. bending it down. But I think it's a combination of maybe somewhat lips, little jaw, jaw and tongue. Yeah, maybe like jaw too. All of those things, things moving a little bit, yeah. Yeah. making the, the pitch 
pitch band and, and ho- hopefully find that sort of optimal oral cavity kind of shape. Yeah. But it's a, uh, I was curious about that. No, I haven't done that. Um, another one that um, was a big topic for Farkas was dynamics. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. He suggests for a great fortissimo, the key is that the lips have to be relaxed to form a large lip opening to allow the air through. What do you see in MRI imagery in terms of dynamics, and especially like going to loud dynamics? Absolutely nothing with respect to what you just mentioned. We aren't looking at lip aperture at all. And uh, frankly, I don't know what I don't know if we could look at lip aperture, but we've certainly looked at two other things that are pretty interesting. One is, again, if you take a coronal slice, slicing down through the head, dividing into the front and left halves or front and back halves, you can look over the surface of the tongue and you can see a channel that's formed between the top of the tongue and the roof of the mouth. That channel is absolutely regulated with different dynamics. At Fortissimo, dynamics, it's large, and it's usually larger in the low range on Fortissimo dynamics. So there's a channel that you're unconsciously, most likely, regulating in play just by using your tongue muscles. Uh, the other area goes back to this glottis that we talked about. Uh, we have definitely seen that that also serves as a valve to regulate dynamics. And we have some mm-hmm. conclusive pictures about that as well, John. Okay, well, that's like good cutting-edge stuff there. And, yeah, and that's that's definitely really helpful, I think, too, to people who might be, be struggling about this. So okay, here's my final topic, believe it or not, okay. for this this thing. And I know there's a lot of, lot of topics we could go to, but for today, my last one has to do with lip trills. Oh, my. Go ahead. Which I'm very curious about. Now, some teachers claim that the tongue moves on a lip trill, even calling it a tongue trill. Mm. And, but personally, I'm inclined to say in my own case, I feel pretty secure to say the tongue is absolutely still. Okay. And the motion is from my lips. Have you worked on trills yet, or is that certainly, like coming in Certainly we have future? lip trills uh, collected and looked at, but not officially reported on. So, again, a lot of what we're talking about here, John, is just raw observations. I am a scientist, and we're going to we're going to be looking at, at quantifying these things and giving them some some heft, you know, some some good scientific heft. But I'm going to talk. I'll be glad to talk about lip trills. Obviously, it depends on the speed that you're doing it. We have we have our subjects, all of them. They do a trill, sixteenth notes at sixty beats per minute, which is quite slow. And there you see the textbook things happening. The ooey that Farkas used to talk about. You can see the tongue actually changing. There's a little bit of even jaw movement in even some of our elite players at that slow speed. When these guys kick it into gear and play as fast as they can, first of all, you can't even see it unless you're filming at 100 frames per second. We've written a paper that showed how important it was to have that high speed. And as far as I know, the guys at the Max Planck Institute are the only ones in the world doing this. So we have a real privilege to use their technology. And I'll tell you this, the tongue's moving. <laughs> it is. Oh, it's man. Moving. And, and how much is it moving? It's moving hardly at all. This lip trill business is something that's such a mystery to teach. You know, you, you, oh, yeah. Most of us, it, it just, there it is, I got it. You know, all of a sudden I've got it. And it's this indescribable, constant air, high speed, something's going on between our lips, we think. And actually, I'm sure that's true. The physics of it all, I don't understand completely, John, but I'm going to tell you this, that in our fastest lip tillers, for example, Andre Just, uh, Marcus Muscuniti, these are European players, the very, very tip of their tongue is moving ever so slightly. And all I can think is that it's somehow upsetting the continuity of that airstream in such a way that it's getting in harmony with some kind of vibrations in the lips. And the physics of that, I, I really want to explore with some people who are qualified to talk about it. But I can tell you, the tongue is moving, but it's extremely slight and hardly visible, even at 100 frames per second, John. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it's kind of... Mm, mm, it's moving, mm. John. <laughs> well, it'll be a good good area for further study here yeah, anyway. Yeah, sure. Uh, great. So, yeah, so this is a lot of great stuff. And again, I, I should have been plugging on the other episodes. You've got a new YouTube channel up. Right. Um, I'll be linked from the article. Just look for um, what's it, what's the title of the channel? Ah, uh, MRI Horn Pedagogy Informed by Science. I think is the name of it. 
And uh, I also, yes, that's correct. Good. I, just, <laughs> I wrote it, but I, I, it's pretty new. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about just real quickly, John, this is a bit of a plug, is that uh, we are, I am, lobbying with, um, lobbying, I'm working on trying to put together what we're calling the International Horn Repository Project. This, um, we find, here's, here's, here's the problem. You get a few elite players, you collect data on them, and you make some wonderful conclusions, and I'm, I'm pretty confident about what we're saying. But I think we need a lot more data, John. And I really think elite players are who we need to study first. And so what I'm proposing is that we have an ongoing, maybe three to four year study with the Max Planck Institute, whereby we bring elite players from all over the world to getting and to be tested on a very carefully thought out protocol that gets at the questions you've raised and more. And this is going to be a very expensive endeavor. So we're looking for grant uh, funding for this. I'm actually working with Annie Bosler a little bit. And also um, Sarah Gillespie, as a matter of fact, is going to do some administrative stuff for me on this. So I'd like, I'd like folks to know that that's coming. And quickly, this repository is going to be meant to serve as a place where teachers and students can go to find basically any question they want to know about what goes on inside the mouth and throat about horn playing. How we'll organize that, I'm not totally sure. But it will also serve, John, as a repository for those studying movement disorders like dystonia, a place where doctors and medical people can go to get some good hard data collected very carefully um, to help inform the work that they do. So I'm really excited about this. I think it's incredibly important. And it'll be probably on that same site where Eli and I are posting these instructional videos as well, just to mm -hmm. let you know. Yeah, no, this is great, and this is all like super exciting. I mean, you you know, people think that uh, you know we know it all by now, right? Yeah. But actually, there's so many directions. Once you look, there's you find more and more directions to go on all of this. So this is what's like super exciting. So um, I'll be again, I'll be super interested to see where this heads. Okay. With everything, definitely keep in touch if you want to talk again sometime about some new topics. Happy to do that. You bet. Um, thank you again uh, to. Uh, Peter Iltis for joining us for the Horn Notes video podcast, and I'll be checking here for more uh, topics of interest related to all things French horn and the Horn Notes video podcast. Thank you again. You're welcome. And uh, in my own studies, I'll, I'll say just as a digression first, among my teachers was Eli Epstein. Epstein and... Um, which is it? I'm going to edit that part. You know, I always say it wrong. I call him Epstein. <laughs> Epstein, okay. <laughs>